Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity hosted by the Maine Department of Education. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm the social studies specialist for the department. Uh, today, I'm happy to welcome John Silva from the News Literacy Project to Maine. John, welcome to Maine. Um, Thank you. As a lot of you may have seen in promoting this session, uh, the News Literacy Project is a group that my national organizations have hosted uh, some, in some of our national conferences and trainings, and it's some, I just think, some of the most essential best work. Um, our previous session, uh, if you were on just an hour ago, you heard about the SIFT. Um, I talked at various points throughout the spring about the SIFT newsletter and also Checkology um, and some of the other resources that the News Literacy Project has. So I'm happy to welcome our participants today and most welcome, uh, most importantly, welcome John Silva from the News Literacy Project. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, I am really excited to be here with you guys today. Um, and so as you probably have noticed uh, earlier, that so this is called What It Means to Be News Literate. So the, the, the main purpose of this is to think about um, where it is that we want students to be when they go through news literacy curriculum. And what, it, what does it mean for them to be able to be reliably informed, not just academically, but also in their, uh, their everyday lives. Um, so this is gonna be kind of a, a high, an overview, focusing a bit on skills and learning objectives, talking about the different things about, you know, the important parts of what it means to be news literate. Um, and then I'll share uh, some resources towards the end um, that I'll, you'll be able to use. Um, uh, while we're doing this, since it is a small group, I do have two, po uh, two points in the presentation where I do sort of pause for questions. Um, but if at any time you feel like you need to ask something, if you need me to clarify or go back and look at a, a slide, uh, please feel free to interrupt um, and just ask. Um, a copy of this presentation uh, will be available in a shared resource folder that um, I will share a link with a little bit towards the end. Um, okay, so uh, my name is John Silva. Uh, I am a former classroom teacher. I'm part of the education team at the News Literacy Project uh, based in Chicago. Uh, I taught social studies in middle and high school for 13 years while I was with Chicago Public Schools. Uh, if you're active on Twitter, um, this is my Twitter handle. I do share a lot of ideas and resources uh, related to news literacy. Um, I have two areas that I tend to focus on primarily. One is the intersection between news literacy and civics and civic engagement. Um, and the other is a lot of the research and work that I've been doing focusing on conspiracy, the conspiracy theories and conspiratorial thinking, which are two uh, major problems uh, going on today. Uh, so a little bit about who, the, who we are at the News Literacy Project. Um, we have uh, active social media accounts. Uh, if you would like to follow uh, any of these accounts, we do share a lot of resources and ideas and teaching strategies. Uh, but we also share a lot of just tips for the general public. So feel free to follow us. Um, and this is a way that we can connect and keep the conversation going um, after, we, you know, after today and as you begin to uh, integrate news literacy into your curriculum. Uh, we are a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Our headquarters is in Washington, DC. Um, we are all about trying to not only provide resources, but professional development for educators so that they can bring this to their students. Uh, because we believe that it's the, the, the best work is done by teachers in the classroom. So we don't do direct instruction, but we do work to, to advocate for news literacy instruction and curriculum to be embedded across the American education experience. We tend to focus primarily on middle and high school. Um, however, our resources and our curriculum has been used with kids as young as fifth grade and even into college. Um, these are our, some of our core organizational values. Uh, we do believe that news literacy is absolutely a, a critical life skill. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. Um, but one of the most important things is just the idea that facts matter. Um, there's, there, are, there are ways that you can argue about opinions and beliefs, but facts are facts, and they can be proven to be true or not. Um, and somehow that gets lost in a lot of the discourse that's going on, especially on social media. And we absolutely, as, a, as an organization founded by a journalist, um, we do believe in the power of the free press and how important that it is uh, for, our, for our government and our democracy and all of the things that we do in our day-to-day in our -day lives. So what do we mean when we say, when we say young people have a right uh, to news literacy education? 
Um, part of this goes to just the basic idea of being engaged in the civic life of your community. Um, in order to be engaged uh, in your community and, and know about and care about what's going on, you have to be reliably informed. And information is, is the basis for every decision that we make. Um, and we really want to emphasize how important it is for young people to know how to be reliably informed. Um, because right now, it is one of the most comprehensive and chaotic and complicated information landscapes we've ever had. Um, we do often think of young people as being digital natives. You know, they're growing up with technology. They're very comfortable with it. But they actually don't really understand a lot of how it works. And they don't have the, sc the skills and the tools necessary to be able to filter through the overwhelming amount of information that can come across our screens. And, and it's up to us, not just as educators, but as, as parents and adults, um, it's up to us to teach them those skills because they're not, they're not gonna learn it on their own. Um, we have to help them to prepare them for how to navigate this, this complicated information landscape, but it's also very empowering. They have access to more information than at any other time in human history. And we have to teach them how to navigate it properly. So what do I mean when we say news literacy? At its most basic function, news literacy is about knowing what's credible and what's not. Um, and part of that is the important role that standards-based journalism plays in informing us about what's going on in our, in our, in our communities. We have to be able to recognize what standards-based journalism is so that we know how to prioritize information that comes from those types of sources. But it's also about under, not just understanding how journalism works, but it's interacting with the news organizations, and the journalists, not only to make sure that we're being reliably informed, but also to hold them accountable to keep quality journalism uh, alive and well. Uh, so I wanna give, show you some examples about sort of the scope of the problem that we're dealing with. And some of this will probably seem familiar to some of you. Um, so this is an example of misinformation that went viral on Twitter. Someone had manipulated an image of the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial um, to suggest that during the recent protests that people had uh, spray painted it with graffiti. Um, it's completely not true. It's a, it's, a, it's a manipulated image. But this type of viral misinformation really distorts and complicates a lot of the important issues that we're, that we're dealing with. And seeing something like this, you know, triggers an emotional response and people will share it without taking time to verify it. This example from Instagram was part of a a uh, series of hoaxes and rumors that suggested that during some of the Black Lives Matter protests, these mysterious piles of bricks were showing up. Um, and the idea was that they were supposedly encouraging people to, to use the bricks to smash windows and to create property damage. Um, but it was, it was proven to be completely not true. But th these types of rumors and hoaxes were very common. And this actually showed up on my Instagram feed from a good friend of mine um, who later uh, later took it down, not realizing that he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have shared it. Conspiracy theories, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, are running rampant, especially on platforms like Facebook, especially with Facebook's, uh, a lot of their closed groups. Um, Wired Magazine actually recently published an article, I can share that in a link later, to talk about these closed communities, these echo chambers where disinformation and conspiracy theories run rampant. Um, and in particular, this is a, this is a major problem on Facebook. Um, but in, these, in these, closed, these closed communities, people just continue to reinforce the things that they believe um, and amplify, in particular, conspiracy theories, as well as different types of misinformation and propaganda. Um, and speaking of propaganda, I'm gonna show you this brief clip from TikTok. That's exactly how I feel. That's exactly how I feel. That's exactly how so the interesting thing is, is that a lot of people don't really think of TikTok as being a platform of misinformation and propaganda and conspiracy theories. And I'm sorry to tell you that it absolutely is. Um, anytime you have a popular uh, social media or communications platform with a large user base, these things are going to show up. As much as we want to think of TikTok as just being funny videos and lip syncs, uh, this type of disinformation and misinformation and propaganda um, are rampant and they are shared quite easily. And the challenge is, is that it, when something, just because something appears on TikTok, it doesn't just stay there. A lot of times these are, these are posted across platforms. Um, and so when I show you these, these examples, we, I want, what I wanna emphasize is that we shouldn't focus on the platform. 
a lot of times we do talk about the platforms and their responsibilities, you know, maybe what they can be doing or not doing for fighting this. But the reality is when we're talking about news literacy and we're talking about educating young people, we need to focus on the skills that they need to evaluate the information. Because it doesn't actually matter what platform it appears on, the skills for, for verifying information, for verifying the, the source and the credibility of that source, those apply across any platform, social media platform, group messaging like WhatsApp or Snapchat. So when we're talking about news literacy, we really need to place the emphasis on the skills so that students can use those skills in whatever platform they use or whatever the next popular social media platform might be. And so one of the questions I want you to think about when you're thinking about your students, you know, and their natural curiosity, when, they, when something like this comes across their social media feeds and they decide to Google it, what are they gonna find? Um, are they gonna be able to critically evaluate it and verify it? Um, or are they simply going to find themselves going down a rabbit hole and, and following the threads of conspiracy theories and misinformation and finding themselves believing things that are not true? So you may not feel a great deal of confidence at the beginning, but hopefully by integrating news literacy into your curriculum and, you, and teaching students a lot of these skills, um, this question will be a lot more confident in this question that when they do start to search for these, they'll actually be a little bit immune to falling for it. And which gets to our essential question. So at the News Literacy Project and our education team, this is the essential question that we use to drive all of our curriculum and resource development. At the end of the day, this is the most important thing that we want to be able, for teachers to be able to answer confidently that yes, when, when, when your students are done in your, in your course, in your classwork, that you, that you do feel confident that they can tell the difference between fact and fiction. So let's go into some of the skills. So some of these are phrased a bit like learning objectives and some skills to learn. So I want to go in and talk about some, some of the things that we want you to think about when you're talking to your students and how we're going to teach it. The first is one of the most important things about misinformation is the role of emotion. Misinformation and propaganda and conspiracy theories are designed to use our emotions to manipulate us into believing something is true when it's not. Um, and so here, this is an example of a, a piece of misin uh, misinformation and propaganda that was spread. And so by manipulating our emotions, what happens is, is that the stronger our emotional reaction, the more the rational parts of our brains are not really involved in that thought processes. As, as adults, for the most part, we, our rational parts of our brain can sort of come back in and we can apply some critical thought after the, that initial emotional reaction. The problem is, the stronger the emotional reaction, the longer that takes. But we have to remember that adolescents are very vulnerable to this because the rational parts of our brains don't develop until about the mid-20s. So our students, especially uh, middle school and high school students, are really only using the emotion centers in their brains. And so they don't have the, the skills uh, to be able to really critically evaluate it unless we teach them some strategies of how to apply it. Now, the interesting thing is, is that older adults are also especially vulnerable to this because as the rational centers of our brains are the last to develop, when we start talking about the, our older years, it's actually one of the first parts that starts to decline. This is why we see misinformation being so easily spread among younger people and the elderly. And so it's, it's the, some of the same mechanisms but this is really gonna be focusing on young people. You may have seen this image that went viral a couple of weeks ago after President Trump's um, uh, visit to St. John's Church in Washington, DC. This image went viral, suggesting that uh, this is a picture of Adolf Hitler um, carrying a Bible in much the same way that President Trump was. Now, the interesting thing is, is that in that strong, especially visceral reaction to Nazi and Hitler imagery, we, we miss the fact that it's actually a very poor Photoshop job. If you take a moment and you look at it a, a little bit critically, you can actually see that somebody just copied and pasted the Bible from one to the other. You can see the shape of the thumb. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a poor Photoshop job. But the problem is, is that in that emotional reaction, we're not really looking at it that closely. Um, and just for context, this is the original photo that was, that was manipulated. Um, the next skill that we need to talk about, um, and these are, these are often emotions, and this are, are sort of the one-two of really important things, is about the differences between news and opinion. 
Um, because the challenge is that when we're looking at sources of news, especially uh, television news and national news networks, uh, the information that's being shared skews very heavily towards opinion and commentary. And so we really need to teach students about the differences about what to look for, because news is about informing us. It's about those standards of quality journalism, about telling us the facts, information that has been uh, verified. Whereas opinion is trying to persuade us, it's trying to influence what we think about something. Um, and they are trying to do it in a way that might be using emotion, is using persuasive language. Um, and it's really important for us to, to know the difference, especially when we're trying to be informed. So one of the resources that we have is an app called Informable. I'll share a link uh, towards the end. Um, it's a free brain training style app that talks about the differences between different news literacy skills. In this case, uh, one mode is called news and opinion. So if you look at this example, you can see that the handle is called post opinions and it says from the editorial board. And there are some key things that we can identify so that we know that this is an opinion piece that we're looking at. Whereas this example from the Wall Street Journal is an example of a news piece. Um, and you can, and it's partly about evaluating some of the differences, and looking at some of the subtle variations. So when we're talking about news, we want to talk about these standards of quality journalism. These are the, these are the standards that journalists and news organizations follow to make sure that when they're, when they're reporting the news, they're doing it in a way that where the information has been verified. Um, and that verification comes from multiple quality sources. Uh, they're presenting an, uh, uh, the information in a, in a way that's fair, showing multiple perspectives and multiple views. Uh, so if we're talking about someone being critical of someone, the person who is being accused has an opportunity to respond and they're reporting the facts and the details. And they're doing it in a way that where they're accountable when they make mistakes. If a news organization makes a mistake, they correct it and they're transparent about the, the process and their connections. And they're also making sure that they provide enough context so that we can understand everything that's going on in what's being reported. In a lot of ways, opinion is the, op the, is the opposite of this. So when we're talking about it, we have to look for things where things are labeled, right? So reputable news organizations will label these things as opinion or commentary. The language is different. We have to, often opinion and commentary is written in the first person. Um, and it's, it's from the viewpoint of a particular person. Um, whereas like in a news article, we're not hearing it from the voice of the journalist. It's written very different. Um, and the language and the, and the tone of an opinion piece is very, very different. And so when we start talking about these differences, it will actually become very apparent for most, most people to be able to see the differences so that we know when we're trying to read something to be informed, we know if we're being informed or if we're being persuaded. Um, a third very important topic, and this one is, is a little complicated, um, is talking about bias um, and the bias in the news media. And in particular, we need to talk about bias as it relates to news, not opinion, um, because by its very nature, opinion pieces are going to be biased. Now, here's how this is going to work. So this is where I'm going to need you, some of you to sort of speak up. I'm going to show you a series of headlines that were recently published um, by news organizations. They're all three headlines are from the same news story or same news event from different sources. Um, and I want to just have, try to have a discussion about um, the bias that you do or don't see in these headlines. So when you see the headlines, please feel free to unmute yourself and comment and, we'll, and look, I wanted to kind of discuss some of the, these headlines to sort of see what you think, okay? So here's the first headline. Philadelphia police inspector surrenders to face charges of assaulting student during protest. So the question here is simply, do you perceive bias in this headline? And please feel free to unmute yourself and share what you think. There's no like allegedly, or it just sounds like surrenders and assaulting. It seems very cut and dry. Okay, so is that a no? No, I, I sent, it feels like a little bit because it doesn't say, well, I don't know now. Okay. <laughs> Originally I was thinking that because it says surrenders to face charges, I can't see the rest of the screen. There's a little thing on it, but 
for oh, a solving sorry. student during contest. It could be, yeah. Other thoughts? I, again, I tend to agree. I thought I thought it it states factually what's happening. Surrender does sound like a loaded word, but yeah. Okay. Like right. factually, what's happening? Okay. All right. Let's go to the next headline. Philly police inspector Joseph Bologna applauded by fellow officers as he surrenders on charges of assaulting a protester. So the question here is: This more biased? Is it less biased? Or is it about the same? I suppose it suggests that there's another side to the story that not everyone may agree with what has happened. Okay. Again, I'm thinking, I do think it's more, more biased. Bias. Sorry, is that my voice? My voice. Uh, go ahead, try it there. Can you, is that better? Yeah, go ahead. I said it was, it just, it sounded more biased because I, I guess I'm just unsure as to how many officers are applauding. Is it, you know, it's plural, but does that mean three? Does that mean a hundred? Does that mean a thousand? So I'm, I'm left a little um, uncertain. And so to me, I would I'd assume the headline is slightly trying to persuade a little bit more of opinion than less. In the chat box, there was a couple people who uh, chimed in to say more biased. Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to show you the third headline. Uh, so large crowd shows support as Philadelphia police staff inspector turns self in on charges of assaulting protester with a baton. Same question, more, less, or about the same? I think it's less, but with all of these, I'd need to read a little bit more. Like I don't, I can't just take the headline as it is. I'd need to read some more information. Surrender was a stronger word than turn self in. So it feels less biased. Okay. And the charges suggest that it's not a definite thing. And John, can I, I'm curious, can I ask her a question of Sonia? Sonia, you said uh -huh. that you, you needed to read more, um, but I'm wondering like how many people read beyond the headline or are you shaped already by the headline that you've read? Right, well, and that's why, so he's asking me or he's asking us what we think if it's biased, <laughs> at least less or more, and for me, I would have to read more because, and I, I don't think that everybody does that, but I would read them like, oh, really? What's that all about? And then I might scan some more and then I get more information. Does your, does your gut make it feel biased off the bat before even reading more? Is that why you feel like you have to read more? Maybe, but also this activity is, is making my gut like double, like question itself because now like, wait a second, maybe he's tricking us. And I'm sorry, <laughs> wait a second. Now he's, tr maybe he's tricking us. So now it like takes on a completely different, like additional layer. So that's why I'm like, uh, never mind. Pretend I didn't say anything. Um, I'm not tricking you, but I am setting you up. I'll, I'll tell you that. And then to, to the other question about whether or not people read it, 59%, um, 59% 59 of articles shared on Twitter, people actually don't click, click the links. And I'm, it's actually part of something I'll talk about in a couple minutes. Um, so let's just look at the three headlines together really quick. And so just looking at them, you know, together. Um, so the first question is like, which one do you think would be most? But let's, let's sort of rephrase the question. What words in these headlines do you think could be perceived as being biased? I still think surrenders seems biased. Okay. I mean, I think large crowd size. And again, I again going back to police officers with plural and large crowd size. I have no, I have no conceptual or context to understand where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. The third one mentions that the assault took place with a baton, which okay. I think gives more power 
to the fact that this person wasn't just assaulted, but you now know what it was, the person was assaulted with. Now, similarly, in headline one, the inclusion of the word student, right? So assaulting a student, right, is different than the, in the others. He, he it says that he's being accused of assaulting a protester. Um, so the thing is, is that um, part of what I asked you to do is, is, is to look at these and talk about your, the, the ways that you perceive these to be biased. Um, and the challenge is, is that talking about perceptions of bias is a very subjective process and it's, it's actually not really all that productive. So one of the things that we need to do when we talk about bias with young people is to try to get to a more objective way. Because these actually bring up some important questions because we do need more context, we do need more information. So that first question, are these straight news pieces, right? Are they from standards-based news organizations? Um, are the details of these headlines accurate and factual, right? Um, yes, it, he was a, he's being uh, accused of assaulting a protester, and that protester was a student. Um, the supporters were fellow officers. Um, but one of the bigger questions that we really want to get to is about can we really explain the type of bias, right? Can we sort of explain it in a way that takes perception out of it? Um, and also recognizing our own biases, which you know, we call confirmation bias. So one of the things that you'll notice is that I didn't actually tell you where these, these headlines were from. So these are the sources from the headlines. So one is from the CNN, the other two are from Philadelphia area news outlets. Um, and so there are some interesting discussions about you know, the sources for these headlines, um, sometimes when we look at the source, um, the logo of the news organization can influence our perception of bias. You know, people can have strong opinions about CNN and other national news networks. And seeing that, head, seeing that on the headline actually will, un, you know, we will unconsciously project our own biases on that headline based on that. Um, so how do we do that? Um, so in our Checkology virtual classroom, um, which I'll share a link towards at the end, um, we have a lesson called Understanding Bias. And what we've done is we have tried to break down a very complicated topic and break it down in a way that students can evaluate uh, bias based on five types, which are, these are the five types. Um, th this, is not an, this is not meant to be an, a, an exhaustive list, but it's, these are the five most common types of bias that we see in the news. Um, that, if, that does affect not only coverage, but also how stories are covered. Um, the other is called forms. Um, and so framing is, framing is an, a, a, an important one. So framing is about the words that we use to describe things. So like the difference between a, assaulting a student and assaulting a protester. Um, story selection is, is another one, right? So how many, you know, how many news organizations picked up on this uh, the story of the police inspector uh, who's being accused of assaulting a protester. Um, and the tone and sourcing, where does information come from? So the idea with teaching bias is that we want to get away from perception and we want to try to get to a way um, that gives us a more objective way of having a discussion about a very complicated topic. Now, one of the challenges is that when we talk about bias in the news media, we often see these charts come up in the conversation. And I'm sure probably almost every single one of you have seen, have seen one version or another of these. Um, if you're not familiar with them, what these try to do is to try to map out all of these sources of information um, based on perceived political uh, bias. Um, the one on the left uh, is a more exhaustive list. And you'll actually see some very problematic sources on the lower left and lower right of the chart. The other one on the right, the all sides, um, tries to differentiate between um, opinion pieces and news pieces, um, but it's still lumping these lumping organizations um, into one very broad category. Um, and here's why these are these are not all that effective when we're talking about bias in news. Um, the the first problem is that it presumes that every piece of information published by these organizations follows the same uh, perceived political bias. The problem is, is that it does generally reflect the opinion pieces, the editorial boards, um, not the news pieces. So it doesn't distinguish between news and opinion. Um, and some of the sources, especially on the, the larger chart, they're not even trying to put out news. They're all about commentary 
and propaganda and opinion pieces. They're, they're not trying to inform us. They're absolutely trying to influence us and persuade us. So talking about an organization like, um, like InfoWars in the same chart as NPR is, is just folly. It's just, it's just a pointless exercise to try to suggest that we can evaluate those two organizations by any of the same metrics or rubrics. Because they are very subjective, and it's, very, it's, it's a very difficult topic to try to distill into one simple chart. And so they are an oversimplification. I think they do have their uses. They can be very effective if you want to look at the general sort of political view of the opinion pieces, and you can sort of see this, especially with the extreme examples. But really, they're not that effective when we're talking about bias in the news, because we need to talk about that in a different way. Um, okay, so here's uh, my first um, pause for questions to sort of see uh, if anybody has any big questions so far that you would like me to talk about in terms of like emotion, news and opinion, um, and bias. Anybody have any questions for John? Okay, I'll keep going then. Um, okay, next skill, um, evaluating posts for evidence. So a lot of times we will see things pop up on social media that are making a big claim, um, but they don't actually provide any evidence to back up that claim. Um, this is another mode in our informable app. So you might see something like this claiming that margarine is only one molecule away from plastic, um, trying to make us uh, scared about the dangers of margarine. Um, but if you, if you take a step back and you look, you can see that uh, it's labeled healthy, holistic living. Uh, the person who posted it is a woman named Michelle Case. Like we don't actually have anything that we can evaluate on our own. This is just making a big claim and there's really no evidence to support it. Whereas this example from the Pew Research Center is talking about the results of a study. Um, and not only are they providing a graph that we can evaluate for ourselves, there's a link that we can click on where we can learn more about the poll about the methodology behind it, and we can and we can evaluate what the results are for ourselves. Um, so being able to evaluate these types of things is a very important skill, um, and it's it's a it's a very common thing. A lot we will see things pop up on social media, and it just expects us to believe it and take it at face value. One example is this um, that came up um, back in March um, in the early weeks of the pandemic there was this viral trend called Film Your Hospital. Um, it was a far right wing misinformation campaign to suggest that things going on in hospitals were not nearly as bad as the, the media was making it out to be. And so this is a short video clip, there's no audio to it, um, where this person took a video clip outside of a hospital and you can see there's, there's nothing going on. And so this person is trying to get us just to accept that um, the, you know, the pandemic is blown out of proportion, we're not being told the truth. But the thing is, like, yes, this is a this is a video of, of, of an empty hospital. We don't know when it was shot, what time of year, what time of day. It doesn't actually prove anything. But the whole thing about this was to suggest that because things were quiet outside of hospitals, then there must not be anything going on inside. And it's this is the type of viral misinformation um, that is very common, especially when we talk about hot button social issues. Um, so how do we how do we teach this? So these are some questions that um, are adapted from the Stanford History Education Group's Civic Online Reasoning Curriculum. If you're not familiar with them, um, the SHEG is a, they do a lot of they've done a lot of research into um, evaluating evidence, um, and some of their reports you know are pretty bleak about how little young people in particular are able to do it. But they have some some important resources, and so it's really about a series of questions. It's about questioning the source and that the source's credibility, looking at the source of the evidence and the credibility of the source of the evidence, and then evaluating the connection between the evidence and the claim if we find those first two things to be credible. And so if we discover that the, the source is incredible, then we can just ignore pretty much the rest of, what, of what's going on. So it's really about a process of teaching students how to, to ask some questions and go through some steps to be able to evaluate um, and so how do we do that? So how do we, how do we check some of these things? So part of this is about fact checking and how to verify information. So I'm gonna show you three really important fact checking skills that will apply to a lot of the different things about misinformation. Um, the first one is simply observation. 
um, much like that image, uh, the, the side by side image of um, Hitler and President Trump with the Bible, right? We want to apply some observation skills. So this image went viral um, back in April. A protester at an open the economy uh, protest was holding the sign. Um, and this was actually featured in our newsletter, The Sift. Um, and so you can see this. And but the thing is, like, if you take a really close look at it, you can actually see that her fingers are bent at an unnatural angle, and the O is not quite complete. And there's some there are some visual cues to suggest that this has been photoshopped. Additionally, if you look around the edges of the sign, you can see a slight pixelation around the edges of the sign. And the thing is, is that signs and T-shirts in particular are two of the easiest things for people to to photoshop. And so just simply. It also adds up to 18, not 19. It does add up to 18, yeah. Um, and you know, we don't know if that was intentional on the, on the, on the part of the person who um, photoshopped it, but it could be. But the thing is, is that if you take a look at it, if you just look at it closely, you can see some cues. Um, the next step is, so, what, so now that you think it might not be true, what are two, a couple things that you can do? So an important fact-checking skill is called lateral reading. So what lateral reading is, is basically, it's an effective strategy of using a search engine. So the, fir the first step is to get off of the, the source that you're trying to evaluate. Open up a new browser tab and start doing a strategic, deliberate search. Uh, so using things like quotation marks, Boolean search terms and such. Um, and then really evaluating the search results uh, carefully. It's called exercising click restraint. Don't just click on the first link that pops up. Really look through and sort of see which sources seem like they might be most relevant, they might be the most reliable, um, and then evaluate those sources. And the idea is that you, you have to keep doing this until you are confident that you either know something is true or you verify that it's not. Um, and these are also adapted from the work over at Stanford. Uh, in particular, this is the, these terms and the strategy was uh, really sort of defined by Sam Weinberg and Sarah McGrew from the Stanford Graduate School of Education. Um, and this, this strategy has become a really important tool um, in fact checking. Um, so here's an example. So taking that, 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 uh, that image, if you, you can simply Google Barack Hussein Obama COVID-19 sign. And when you look at the, the, the first results, the first one, is a link to a Snopes article fact-checking the sign. The second is, uh, is a news article from AP talking about the woman holding the sign that it was, um, that it was uh, altered. Um, and then the third one is, it's only sort of very vaguely related. It's not really directly related to the sign, but it's about how AP fact-checks um, information. But if you go further down in the results, um, because you use, you know, like Barack Obama, you will get results that don't actually result, uh, relate to what you're trying to search. So this is why it's really important to look at all the search results and really sort of figure out which ones would be most relevant because these are on the first page of results, but they actually are, are not really useful in any way for verifying the image. Um, the third tool is called reverse image search. So what a reverse image search is, it's a specialized search engine and what it does is it takes uh, a digital image and it tries to match the pixel patterns to other images in the search database. Um, and it will usually, depending on the image you're searching, it will either show you uh, images that match or images that, are, that, are, that the algorithm thinks are similar. Um, and so this is where evaluating those search results and exercising clicker strings is also very important because you really have to look to see that you're looking at something that's directly related to the image that you're searching. Um, Google Images is a very popular uh, reverse image search database, as are TinEye and Yandex. Um, and I'll show you one way of, of doing it, probably one of the simplest ways, but there are multiple ways to search. You can upload an image to some of these search engines. There are reverse image search apps um, and programs that are available. Um, and so we can talk about a bit more of some of those other ones at another time. So uh, here's um, th that same tweet, that same image. If you right click on an image using your mouse, a menu pops up and it says search Google for image. Um, depending on your browser or operating system, it may say it, it may use a different search engine, but they're all effectively the same. Um, and you can see that these are the results that come up from that reverse image search. Um, the first two are, are, are again, fact checks. Um, 
and then if you look down, um, this is where really evaluating the results is also important because these results are on the first page of results. They match the images, but these are really just sites that are that are spreading and sharing the original manipulated image. They're not actually doing any kind of fact checking. So, um, a, a note about fact checking sites, um, and I'll answer some questions if you have. So, fact, there's a lot of different fact checking sites out there, and people tend to be critical of some for, for various reasons. But one of the most important things that we want to emphasize with young people about fact checking sites is that. The ones that are re reputable and responsible are the ones that show their work. Um, they're not just telling us the determination of the fact check. They're providing the evidence that they found that helped them reach that determination. So they're providing context, they're providing evidence, they're providing sources. So we can, we can see whether or not something is true and we can also see how they know so that they're, they're not just telling us, they're showing us. Um, and so it's really important to remember that there's a lot of different fact checks out there. Um, and it's, so we have to evaluate them, um, each one individually, so that we know which ones that we can tend to rely on. Um, so I'll pause here again, just, just to see if there's any questions about uh, evaluating evidence or just some general questions about fact checking. I had put in the chat box that when, um, trying to think, when were you guys at CS4? San Francisco, 2017, the reverse image search was like the best little simple trip, right? There's so many different things in there, but that was so fascinating because especially on social media, um, there's so many places, right, where you see the sign done on. I'm so glad you said the signs and the t-shirts. Um, I've uh, yeah. with the guys over and over again, right? They change the image and how easy you can do to do that. Um, but then I just see Cindy had replied that she said, I've not seen any images. Cindy, I don't know if you want to uh, clarify what you're asking. And then Jessica has a couple of questions as well. I wasn't sure, John, if you were actually showing us on the screen how to do that image check, reverse image check. Yeah, so that's this right here. Can you see, can you see my screen? I can see your screen, but it still says tip for effective lateral reading. Oh, weird. John, I, I, I saw can, the image. I saw the image. So am I like somehow stuck? <laughs> uh, you might be. Okay, um, right now, John, if this is what you have up, I see the picture, I see a screenshot where you've done a right click and it says search Google for image is what I see. Yeah, that's what's on my screen. I think I'm off by one or two screens. Should I go out and come back into the meeting? Yeah, why don't you, well, I'll, I'll pause here while you do that. We'll see if it resets for you. Bye. Um, yeah, so reverse, reverse image search is, is such a simple tool to use. And once you start using it, you're gonna find yourself using it all the time. Um, and I have, an, I, mean, I have an app on my phone um, I have a separate app um, on my tablet. I use I use reverse image search uh, all the time. It's not as a, reverse image search can be very effective, but it's actually not as effective as sometimes as lateral reading um, because it it is really a narrow search because it's trying to match the pixel patterns of a particular image. And if it's an image that's fairly new um, or it's it's something that someone has has created, you may not. Um, you may not, it may not pop up in the search results right away. So, so really we need to be t talking about when to use these tools. Reverse image search can be good, but it tends to be very narrow. Um, was, it, was it Cindy, are you back in? I'm back and I now see what everyone's seeing. Awesome. I'm not sure what okay. happened. Okay. Um, so what this was, Cindy, so this is, this is the image um, in the context of the original tweet. I right clicked on the image and then this menu pops up and, it, and you click on search Google for image. Now, a couple other ways that you could do this. So you'll see right above it, it says um, copy image address. So you could also use the URL of an image and put it into a reverse image search database as well. But doing the right click and doing it this way is one of the easiest. Um, and then it comes up with the results this way. And then you evaluate it the same way that you would do with lateral reading. Um, other questions? I think there was one other question. I have a question about, you said that the kids should look to see if a source is considered, if they think it's credible. Well, 
what if I have a bunch of kids or a group of kids or even just one who thinks that Fox News is a credible source? Like they think he, he or she might think it's a credible source and it might be uh, an online source that cites mm -hmm. Fox News and that, well, it's credible, it's Fox News. How, I mean. Well, so that's why I think that's when you have to push back on the student to, to explain why they believe it's credible. Because so the thing is, is that um, we can't lose the old, it, it is it's news. But so one of the things when we talk about news organizations in particular, is like, we want to talk about those standards of quality journalism, right? So it's not just we don't want to keep we don't want it to be that broad, right? We don't want them to say, well, it's reliable because it's Fox, right? We want to ask, so who's the journalist? Um, what do you know about the person who wrote this article? And can you demonstrate that they're trying to inform you using the standards of quality journalism? Or if they're trying to persuade you, right, are they actually using um, reliable evidence? And can you evaluate that evidence? And what's the credibility of the sources of that evidence? So it's, it's a, that's a sort of another pathway that's it's a, it's kind of a deeper dive into opinion pieces when we talk about evaluating the strength of an argument, right? Um, one of our lessons is called arguments and evidence, you know, and we talk about like logical fallacies and we talk about what it means for an opinion piece to be supported by evidence. And so it's really about not just about saying, well, you know, Fox is reliable, CNN is reliable. You know, we really want to push back on students and say, well, who's the journalist, right? Are they writing about this from a position of where they've, in, they've verified information and they're following the standards? Or are they a reputable expert in this field and they're trying to persuade us about something that they believe in and showing it? So it's, we really have to get to a point where students are, are able to go you know, deeper into what credibility is, what makes a piece of information credible, and how do we know? Um, and you know, I, I would strongly encourage you to say like, don't just accept everything from one source, right? You really have to, you really have to be critical at a much deeper level when we talk about where we get our information from. And couldn't the same be said if you have a student relying on NBC or MSNBC? I mean, oh, yeah. this reporting agency is just that. And aren't we asking kids to drill down a little bit more? And all of us really to drill down a little bit more to find the nuggets of truth as best we, we can. We absolutely are. Okay. We absolutely are. And, and I think that one of the most important things that we have, we have to also remember is that when we're evaluating news from a news organization, we have to evaluate them over time, yep. right? What we, what we want, really want to look for are patterns, right? So we Absolutely. can't just dismiss a source because, you know, they, got, they made a mistake somewhere or one thing that they published had uh, demonstrable bias. We really want to look over time. And over time, we may realize that there's, there are patterns that emerge. Um, some organizations you may see, if you can find, you know, like maybe a story selection bias, or big story bias, you know, looking at those, if we see a pattern, right, then we can start to question the credibility based on a pattern of information over time. Um, or maybe it's an individual journalist. We can sort of see that they always cover a certain type of story from a certain way and they exclude certain sources, right? So it's right. really about being critical over time and not just accepting really anything at face value. Yeah. Um, and that's where those standards of quality journalism come into play and evaluating evidence. John, quick follow up, and I, I think I know where you'll say, but I, you know, I think in, in this time, in these weeks and months, you know, some people might claim, well, um, I'm, I'm going to write this unnamed, and you know, because of fascism and, and, and people who are going to, you know, I'm going to lose my job if I say X, Y, or Z, which mm -hmm. is, you know, the, the politically correct term. H how can we respond, you know, either to students or to colleagues and, and neighbors who you know, gaslight or gas lamp these things and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and hide behind why well, I can't say this because, you know, if I do, you know, I I'm going to be in trouble. Yeah. So an important thing to remember is when we're talking about unnamed sources, which are more commonly and inaccurately referred to as anonymous sources, right? Unnamed sources actually have a place in standards-based journalism. And one of the most important things we have to remember is that um, those sources are not anonymous to the journalist uh, or the news organization. Generally speaking, the journalist and at least one editor or someone else at that news organization 
knows the identity of that person, and they've had a conversation with them about why they're going to be unnamed. And a reputable news organization, when they use an unnamed source, is going to tell us why that person is unnamed. Um, and so it, it is, they are asking us to trust them to a certain point, but they have to provide enough context information for us to understand why. And yeah, sometimes whistleblowers and people are afraid of sharing information because there could be consequences. Um, but the reality is that we have to be critical because it should be used sparingly. Um, and we have to try to remember that information from those sources also generally should be verified in some way by the news organization if they can. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely should be skeptical of anonymous or of unnamed sources, but we also have to look for information from that organization that's publishing it that tells us that they may actually have a, a reason that they are able to justify their use. Um, whereas if somebody is just putting something out on social media and they're hiding behind an anonymous um, you know, pseudonym or you know, a fake identity, if we have no way of knowing who they are or why, like there's no check there. There's no one that's really sort of you know, making sure that this person is putting out factual information. So we do need to be a, a lot more critical with unnamed sources. But we also have to recognize that there are times when their use is legitimate. Does that kind of get to your point? Uh, when you came around at the end, yes, but the first half or two thirds was, was excellent. They were spot on and, and I, I loved hearing that. That was okay, good. Useful. All right. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next section. Uh, do, you have um, a, do you have a second? Jessica's put some questions in. Some oh, sure. I can Absolutely, either, we got time. I can either read them for you or do you want to just take a peek? Um, why don't you just read them because when I put the chat box up, it kind of blocks people's screens. Okay, um, so she's kind of got three. I'll let you kind of bundle them however you want. Okay. Um, one, what fact checking sites do you recommend? Two, how do you correct misinformation or disinformation on social media, especially when people do not trust the news and claim that accurate news sources are fake news? And then question number three, isn't Fox mostly inaccurate and known for conspiracy theories, even using propaganda? Um, okay, so the, the first question about fact checking sites, I don't generally prefer to endorse one over another. There are several really amazing fact checks uh, organizations that are out there um, that are doing some great work. PolitiFact, um, Snopes does, does a lot of good work, AP News, AFP Fact Check. There's, there's a lot of them that are out there doing that work. Um, what I really try to recommend is that you evaluate those fact check sites over time and you, you find one that you feel comfortable trusting, right? Because in the end, how we know what to trust is a very sort of, it's a very personal thing. Right? These sites have to earn our trust. Um, so I could, I mean, I could sort of pick one over another, but in the end, it's really about your comfort level and how much you trust a source um, because you might see things differently than I do. Um, debunking misinformation is very tricky. Um, what we really want to get to is, a, so we, we want to avoid confrontation as much as we can. If somebody posts something that's not true, you don't want to call them out and, and, and sort of berate them or embarrass them because what that will do is it will create what's called the backfire effect, right? We, if we are put on the defensive, we actually may hold on to that falsehood a little bit more strongly. Um, there's a couple ways that you can approach it um, using empathy and questioning. Um, so for example, if somebody shares that, a manipulated image that's, you know, it's been photoshopped, um, you can sort of push back and say, wow, that's a really shocking image. Um, but you know, I'm really skeptical of, of images that people share on so social media, especially viral, viral images. I saw a different version of that photo. Um, I'm going to share it with you. I want to know what you think. So part of the idea is, is to empathize and try to introduce evidence through questioning so that the person will look at it for themselves. Um, you don't want to just say, well, that's wrong here. Look, here's the real image. You really want to approach it in a way that lets them evaluate the new, the new information for themselves and sort of come to the conclusion on their own. You don't want to, you want to really want to avoid confrontation. Um, you can also say, well, oh, that's, that's really shocking. So where did you get that? Like, who's that from? Um, and have them sort of look at the, that themselves. But the other important point is that you have to keep your expectations low 
and be willing to walk away because if it's something that somebody believes in very, very strongly, um, you know, our beliefs in those ways, our social and political beliefs become very uh, closely tied to our identity. Um, and we don't often like that to be challenged. So you can sort of gently push and question and share, but you also have to be willing to walk away and keep your expectations very low. Um, the third question about Fox News, um, you know, there are a lot of criticisms for Fox and many other news organizations that are out there. There's a lot of different ways that are problematic. Um, and I, you know, I, I almost never want to completely dis dismiss everything from a particular source because, you know, there are journalists who are producing news at organizations like Fox, you know, organizations that, that people perceive to be hyper-political. A lot of the, the accusations of bias that are leveled at Fox are also leveled at places like MSNBC. Um, and, you know, you can, you can identify clear political biases in a lot of their opinion pieces and commentary. But it's one of those things, again, where we really want to evaluate it over time. And, you know, that's, again, that's a personal issue of trust, right? If you are evaluating them over time, you know, you may see the patterns that will cause you to dismiss it. But I'm always, I'm always hesitant to sort of say, I will never evaluate information from a source because we always have to be open to information from sources. Um, unless we know for certain that you, they, like an organization like InfoWars, right? Um, Hyper-partisan conspiracy theory laden places, you know, we can clearly identify those, but we always have to be open to be willing to, to that we could be informed from a source like Fox, like MSNBC, um, unless, you know, it's a personal trust issue. I hope, I hope I answered those three questions well. That was a lot. Are we good? I think you're good. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so satire. Um, recognizing satire is actually also a critical skill uh, because when we think of satire, um, a lot of us think of The Onion. Now, The Onion has is, is got a lot of very funny content. A lot of it used to be sort of ridiculous, over-the-top things like this. But in recent years, The Onion and many other satire sites have become very political. And the more political they become, the easier it is for people to be fooled into thinking that it's real. Um, so here's this example about, uh, you know, a satire article about you know the protests around police brutality. Similarly, there's a site called the Babylon Bee, uh, capitalizing on the image of President Trump at St. John's Church, um, and using this to sort of make a satirical point. Um, if you're not familiar with the Babylon Bee, that they're they're they've been around for a few years. They used to be um, actually uh, interestingly focused on Christian satire, uh, but they've gotten very political in recent years. Um, and so one of the big questions that, besides identifying satire, is like, what is satire? How clearly should it be labeled? So if you look at the, the uh, profile pages of these two, you know, The Onion, right, it says, America's finest news source, right? There's nothing in here to suggest that they're a satire website. You know, most people know about The Onion, but, you know, if, you, if you're fairly new to, to the information landscape, like a young person, you may not have heard it. Um, the Babylon Bee, though, if you, you, their, their account, it says fake news that you can trust. Um, but satire doesn't just come from organizations like, you know, that publish satire. We also have things like this. So I just seen on Fox News that Twitter censored my president and still your president, by the way, and it feels good to say it. They censored my president. and it's pissing me off and all them other little nerds out there in silicon valley ain't got nothing better to do than to fact check my president for what just because he shares misinformation it's called uh, so alternative the interesting facts thing is, is i don't know if you've seen you may or may not have seen uh brent um but he he puts out a lot of videos like this and a lot of people think that it's a real person um but the reality is that he's a comedian um, and if you go to his account page, you can see it's labeled here. You're here because you thought that video was real. Um, and the thing is, like, that's a character, a character that he created. But if you go and if you look into some of his videos, the people who are commenting on them and sharing them, 
think that he's actually, you know, that's a real Trump supporter. Um, and that's the thing is that satire is not always, you know, defined in one particular way. Um, but it's important to remember when we talk about satire that it is a type of misinformation because it's using humor as that emotional response to try to manipulate us um, because it's trying to make us laugh and we may share something or get angry at something um, not, you know, not being in on the joke. Um, sometimes people will share it out of context. So someone may take a video from Brent Terhune, for example, um, and share it outside of his, his account. You may not know who it is. Um, and so sometimes things will, people will create things and it, it will go viral and they'll try to claim that they were just kidding. It was just satire. So, Cause a lot of times satire is used as, as a defense, um, if there's pushback. Um, so the thing is, is like when we see something, we have to verify it just like we would any other kind of information. Um, now we talked about this a little bit earlier about clicking on the links and reading the articles. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here because this is absolutely a critical skill that lots and lots of people need. Um, so this is from 2016. So Ronda, uh, Ronda Rousey, former MMA fighter, uh, posted this on her Twitter account. There's an article from NPR called Why Doesn't America Read Anymore? Um, and if you go into the comments underneath the tweet, you can see lots of comments from people about why Americans don't read anymore, right? Nobody respects the value of a library anymore. People are lazy and stupid. People are inundated with social media and circuses and bread. And so people have all kinds of thoughts and ideas and angry comments about, about why Americans don't read anymore. And if you had clicked on the article, you would have discovered that it was an April Fool's joke from NPR. Um, and the April Fool's joke was also about why people don't click on links. Um, because the reality, back in 2016, researchers at Columbia University and the French National Research Institute um, did a study on Twitter to sort of see how often do people actually click the links. And what they found is that 59% of links shared on Twitter, and this is back in 2016, um, people don't actually click on it. But what the problem is, is that they're commenting on it, they're sharing it, they're retweeting it, they're liking it, they're arguing about it in the comments about something that they didn't actually read, right? They're basing it on a headline, an image, and a lead sentence. And that's pretty much it for the most part. Um, now, the April Fool's joke is, is kind of funny, but this is actually a really important problem um, using that. So Twitter has recently, uh, they recently announced that they're actually going to find a way to try to encourage people to read it. So there's going to be a new prompt. I haven't seen it yet. They just announced this a couple weeks ago, or a little over a week ago, um, that when you go to retweet something, you may be prompted to ask if you'd like to open it first. Um, which I think is a, an important step in the right direction in terms of the platforms, but it's a skill we really need to reinforce. Um, because, so this is a news article that was posted back in January. So this is from ABC News um, about a piece of proposed legislation. A state senator in Vermont introduced a bill that would have banned the use of cell phones for anyone under the age of 21 in the state of Vermont. Um, and this one, the same, the same uh, story, this one published from CNN, Democratic State Senator John Rogers, right? And he's quoted here, cell phones are just as dangerous as guns. Um, and that's, that's a quote from the state senator. And if you look at some of the comments, people are commenting on it, right? Rise up, what's the reason? Um, government overreach, you know, accusations of the nanny state. Um, but the reality is, if you had clicked on it and read the article, and so the example on the right from my NBC5, which is actually an affiliate in Vermont, they actually provide some important context because the bill he filed, he never actually intended for it to, to, to be enacted. He even said that he wasn't going to, he wouldn't vote for it. He knew it wouldn't pass, but he proposed the bill because he was trying to make a statement and a protest against what he felt was Vermont's overreaching gun control legislation. And so the thing is, is that if you only base your opinion on the headline and the lead, you're, you know, you're missing out on really important context. And in this case, it, you know, this is, a, this is a problem. It's not only a problem of our habits about clicking and reading the articles. It's a challenge for these news organizations, right? Because they're the ones writing the headlines and the leads and posting it to social media. It's also a bit of a challenge on the part of the platforms by how much they do or don't share when a link is, is posted, especially in Twitter or, or Facebook, right? How much or how little information from the article is shared um, influences whether or not we want to open it. 
or whether or not we should. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can fix this, but you know, for our purposes, one of the most important things we want to encourage people is before you share it, before you comment on it, click it and read it. Um, okay, so some questions that I want to pose to you um, for you to think about as we're sort of taking away from this, this, this uh, webinar and some things for you to take back to talk to your colleagues. Um, so these are just kind of some big questions for you to be thinking about in terms of what you want to do with the information. So the first is about the connections between news literacy and your curriculum. Um, I'm really hopeful that you've seen some, some important ways that you can tie these skills to things that you're already teaching in your classes, right? Source verification, looking for reliable sources, verifying and fact-checking information, you know, being able to talk about bias, right? These apply not just to the news that we consume in our social media, it applies across so many different areas. So thinking about how news literacy not only is an important life skill, but it's also something that can reinforce and enhance some of the things you're already teaching. Um, how can you reach across to other teachers in your grade level um, and other subject areas, right? As I mentioned at the beginning, like this is very comfortable in a social studies classroom, but there's a lot of different ways that other teachers can do this. The way science is reported in the news and talking about scientific issues. Um, issues of data visualization and charts and graphs and how people use statistics um, in a math classroom, you know, English classrooms as well. Um, health, uh, health news and misinformation, right? So we have PE and health teachers who are talking about things. There's a lot of different ways that we can be using these skills across curriculum areas. And then the other important thing that we should be talking about in our schools, but also in our districts, is where do we start and how do we scaffold this for vertical alignment, right? My son, who's currently in fourth grade, actually started some, some basic news literacy um, last year when he was in third grade. Um, so there are some of these things that we can teach at a younger age, and we can start building those, those skills over time. Um, oh, and one other quick thing I wanna mention about the cross-curricular thing and the scaffolding. Please, absolutely, you should be engaging your librarians in this conversation. Um, librarians are one of the most important resources when we're talking about verifying information and being informed. Um, librarians have been doing this work for years and years and years, and they are at the front lines of this. Um, and they can be a really important resource and focal point uh, for teaching news literacy. Um, so a couple of things that also that you can do, and so this is one of those things where I really like to make an impassioned plea about modeling, right? Not only about being as educators, but also by our friends and our family members, people who follow us on social media, the things that we share, right? We need to be practicing these ourselves, right? We need to model these skills, not just for our students, but we need to model them for our, our children, we need to model them for our parents and our, our siblings, our family members and our friends. We need to be practicing these ourselves because like, this, is, this is our fight too. Um, and so, you know, take a pause. Think about your emotional reactions. Are you, are you reacting to a, a, a news story because it's, it's a sad event, it's something that's, that is affecting you, or is it because you're being, your, emission, your emotions are being manipulated? And just take a minute and do a quick check. Um, really thinking about some of these things. I'm gonna share a, a flow chart in just a second um, about how you can check some of these things. Um, so as I'm getting ready to wrap up, I just wanna, I'm hoping that you sort of see just the importance of news literacy as a, as an important uh, subject and set of skills to be teaching to young people. Um, so I'm gonna pause here for just to see if there's any other additional questions and then I'll, I'll uh, share some of the resources that we have that you'll be able to use. Any questions for John? Okay, let's talk about some resources. We got about 15 minutes. Okay, all right, so um, the first thing, so on our website at newslit.org, we have a really important page that's really about COVID-19 misinformation. This is geared generally towards the general public. Just give me one second. Um, sorry about that. Um, okay, so, we, so uh, things relating to COVID-19, we have these on our website. Um, we mentioned earlier the Checkology Virtual Classroom. Um, this is our free um, online learning platform that you can sign up for and your students can have their own accounts uh, to be able to go through the lessons. It is a comprehensive uh, set of 
um, learning activities and exercises for teaching news literacy. Um, there are 13 primary lessons that are on the platform. Um, so a couple of them I've already mentioned. Um, so we do talk about different types of misinformation. We have some civics related uh, topics on the First Amendment and uh, you know, investigative journalism and press freedoms. Um, so you can, you can use all or just a few of these lessons. It's completely customizable and it is a free platform um, for you to use. Um, part of our Checkology platform is called the Newsroom to Classroom Program. We have a directory of journalists that we have recruited and trained who are available to talk to your students about journalism and the profession and uh, about news literacy. Um, we are continually recruiting new journalists to join our database. Um, most of them are available for video, uh, but some of them, when, when uh, conditions uh, permit, are also available for in-person visits, although I don't off the top of my head know of if we have any in Maine. Um, so that quick check, so verifying information for yourself actually takes less than two minutes. So we have an infographic called How to Know What to Trust, talking about some of these, these decisions that you can make and some skills that you can do about how you can check out different types of content from different types of sources. Um, it is available in a PDF. Um, here's a bit.ly link directly to that PDF, um, but a copy of it is also in a shared Google Drive folder. Um, I'm gonna share a link to that folder in just a minute where we have uh, compiled a, a number of additional resources um, that you can use, they're all free. Um, for how you can sort of choose which ones might be most effective um, in your classroom. Um, we mentioned the SIFT earlier. So the SIFT is our weekly newsletter um, that provides, uh, a, you know, we say real-time teachable moments. So it's a roundup of things that are viral, trends and misinformation, um, ways that you can incorporate it and integrate it into your classroom. Um, the SIFT is currently on summer break. Um, Peter and Susanna, my colleagues who write the SIFT, are working on some other projects this summer and it will be coming back, I believe, in early September. Um, our app, Informable, it is a free app and it is ad-free. It's our brain training style app available on, on uh, Apple or on Google Play. Um, we go through four key modes. Um, this is, uh, I think, a really important resource that you can share with friends and family members for talking about some of these skills. Um, one of the other things that I would just want to give a shout out to, we do professional development events called News Lit Camps. Um, so what this is, it's a day of professional development where we work with a school district and a local news organization um, for a day of professional development where we bring educators into the newsroom and we have a day of conversations about news literacy, about journalism, about things that are affecting news coverage in the community. Um, it is very much uh, focused on a, a local community, the school district and news organization. Um, and it's a very engaging, very fun day of professional development. I'll be honest, it's one of my, one of the things that we do that I'm actually most proud of because it's something that we get such incredible feedback from educators. Um, if you think that your school district might be interested in it, we have a form here. There's a bit.ly link on the screen. Um, if you fill out that form, it'll go to uh, my team uh, my colleague Miriam, who, will, who takes those, and we will sort of, uh, sort of reach out and sort of see if, if there's a possibility that we could bring a newslet camp um, to your district. It is completely free for a school district. Um, we, uh, it is, those, are, those are grant funded, so it's a, it's a free resource that we also provide. Um, so here's a link to the folder. Um, as with all bit.ly's, this is case sensitive. So this is a Google Drive folder. Um, it has a, a number of resources that you can download. Um, there is a subfolder, uh, main DOE, um, where a PDF of this presentation um, is saved. So you can go ahead and um, when you go there, you can download that and you can have a copy of it. Um, so please feel free to check out that. Um, we'll be sure to send out the link in an email if you need it. Um, and then the last thing as I close out and see if there's any additional questions, um, your feedback is absolutely critical to us and our mission for providing quality professional development. Um, so this is a short survey um, that I would really appreciate your feedback on. Um, if you could take a minute to fill it out when you have a chance. Um, it really helps inform us in how well we're doing, ways that we can improve. Um, you can add your email address if you would like to subscribe to the SIFT, um, and we use your feedback to figure out how we can keep improving our professional development offerings. 
Um, so that uh, comes up to the end of my time and my present, you know, my information for you. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes uh, if anyone has any additional questions or anything else they'd like to talk about. Well, John, let me first definitely start by saying thank you uh, again. I know I had reached out. Um, we connected through Peter because I'd seen Peter do a lot of this work. And it's just I'm so timely. And again, I, I can't even speak to the amount of learning. I feel like I was reminded about the past three sessions about media and news literacy because uh, how much of it is just you, I think a lot of it gets put on the back burner because it's always there. The news is always around. Um, us, we interact with it so many ways. I think we've almost become numb to just the different ways that it, it's in our life. So there were so many great reminders about um, that in there. So I want to thank you for that. Okay. Can I just double check one thing because I get a ton of emails every day and I've been half trying to hedge my bet on this, but I believe News Literacy Project said Checkology for next year is, is free. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's one of the things I've been talking about as a resource that's fantastic that was under a pay piece before and at least moving forward for next year will be a free one so I would definitely yes. um, urge people to check that was an important change in our in our strategic plan realizing that uh, it, it, it's just it's such a critical especially this year it's such a critical time for teaching news literacy um, and also so one of the things um, you know I mentioned the 13 lesson one of the things that we're working on right now that I'm actually really excited is on Sometime uh, next year, we will be launching a new lesson, a 14th lesson, which will focus on conspiracy theories and conspiratorial thinking. Um, I'm currently in the process of developing that lesson. We're working on an outline and learning objectives at the moment. So uh, we're gonna be working on that. Um, and we have uh, Renee DeResta from Stanford University is gonna be our subject matter expert on that. So we're really excited to be working on that. There is one question in the chat box, at least so far. Um, Jessica's asking, how do we promote accurate journalism? Um, so part of what I like to encourage people to do is like when you're talking about journalism, with, especially with students, if you're doing current events regularly, is have your students start collecting a list of journalists that they, um, that they trust, especially at the local level. I think starting with local journalism is such an important place for, for talking about journalism and civics because, you know, those are the journalists that are covering things that are affecting your community. Um, and really looking at those standards of quality journalism, right? So when we, when we talk about those standards, you know, which journalists are following them, you know, most closely, most rigorously. And so who, who are the ones who are really earning your trust? And I think po uh, posing it that way to young people is important. Like, so, you know, remember these people, you know, these journalists need to earn your trust, right? You shouldn't just trust them because of who they work for, right? And so talking about trust and, you know, who you, who you trust, and have, that could be a really good discussion point um, with students because it, it gives them some agency and some ownership of, the, of those decisions. Other questions for John? Give, Kirsten, is that a hand going up? No, okay. I'll give one last call for our official on the record, you're being recorded questions. One last call. John, I will give you our formal thank you for our, um, from our participants here today, those who may watch this um, later on. And again, I think that there's gonna be a good um, group of people who watch this. Again, I think I've got Great. this little bundle of stuff. So thank you for your time today. I just shared my email address in the chat box. Um, if anyone would like to reach out to me directly with questions or uh, needing some ideas of accessing resources, please feel free to email me directly. I'll be happy to help in any way that I can. And thank you, Joe, and thank you uh, for your time. And thank you everyone for joining today. Um, this was a really fun conversation. I really hope you found it uh, useful and informative.